Hello, hello everyone, Inquisitor Phone here, and in today's video I would like to talk about ab humans in the Warhammer 40k setting. We've talked extensively on the subjects of transhumans, the Custodes, the Astartes, Thunder Warriors, Primarchs, and even a few alien species, so I think it's time that we talked about ab humans on the channel. What are ab humans? Basically, they're humans who have evolved to such an extent that they have become their own family branch in the tree that is the human species. The degree to which they evolve varies and is expressed differently and at different levels, but their genetic structure is different from standard human beings. This difference can be passed down to offspring continuing that particular strain of ab human. The difference between a transhuman and an abhuman is that usually a transhuman is created by mankind in some way or purposely made to be what they are and the effects of such transformation cannot be passed down through normal means of sexual reproduction. For abhumans, physically branching off into another family of humanity was largely due to circumstance and survival. A lot of abhumans in the 40k setting had no choice in how they evolved. However, there were many abhuman species that were purposely designed either during the dark age of technology and humanity's past, or by the Adeptus Mechanicus in the 40th millennium, which were made to survive in certain environments, and these modifications could be passed down which made them into a kind of abhuman. There is also a difference between abhumans and mutants in the setting, as mutants are humans that have certain mutations which may or may not be inherited by offspring and do not specifically deviate into their own family of humanity. Some mutants were also created in humanity's past, which are considered in the modern setting of 40k to be abhumans. Some mutants can't pass down their mutations, which would make them just mutants and not abhumans at all. Some mutants can pass this down, which led to the creation of a new kind of abhuman. The subject of mutants and abhumans can get a little bit mixed up, so in this video I will be talking about abhumans whose condition is passed down indefinitely, which can lead to the perpetuation of their species, whether or not they were created by humanity in its distant past during the dark age of technology. For this reason, I will be excluding psychers, which are humans who have the ability to interact with the warp in an active way because they are such through a genetic mutation which is not always passed down. I will be excluding pariahs, also known as blanks, who do not have a presence in the warp because they are also the result of having the pariah gene, which is also not always passed down. I will be excluding perpetuals designated homo superior because they are the result of a mutation and their state of being does not always get passed on to offspring and when they do get passed on the offspring usually does not have the ability to produce offspring of their own. I will be excluding navigators designated homo navigo as even though their state of being can be passed down to future generations they were an engineered species of mutant that were engineered into existence during the dark age of technology and are considered mutants more than they are considered abhumans. Last but not least, I will also not be discussing the leagues of Votan in this video. Had their mythology and lore stayed close to their abhuman squat narrative, I would have, but we have since discovered that they are a galaxy-faring race of clones. Many abhumans can or do play an important role in the organization of the Imperium's human fighting force, the Astra Militarum. While there can be whole regiments and planetary defense forces composed of abhumans, they are usually regulated to the abhuman auxilia forces, which are reserved for abhumans and their commanders that lead them. However, they are not treated with the same respect or equality as regular troops in a regiment or as regular citizens in the Imperium, and this is because of certain beliefs that the Imperium holds toward abhumans and mutants in regards to the purity or their corruptibility. There are different schools of thought in the Imperium of Man regarding abhumans, but the general consensus is that the less human something looks, the more suspicious it is, which puts a lot of abhumans under scrutiny. Most abhumans are treated as second class citizens in the Imperium. This is why a lot of the names for the various abhuman strains are actually derogatory in nature. 
A few things should be stated before we begin. The first is that most app humans came into existence during the age of strife, after the dark age of technology, as it would take thousands of years for the human species to begin to deviate from what is standard. The dark age of technology lasted for around 10,000 years, and the age of strife lasted for about 5,000 years. While it isn't known when exactly the dark age of technology would begin to falter, even if we started the clock at the beginning of the Age of Strife in the 25th millennium, those 5,000 years add up to almost 170 standard human generations, more than enough time for our human populations to begin to deviate from the normal and extreme environments. And that's not even talking about or taking into account those deviations which were imposed onto these populations. For those app humans which will be featured in this video, we are going to go over their pseudoscientific name, if they have any, their descriptions, and their role, if any, in the Imperium of Man's Astra Militarum. Not only that, I would like to share ideas on how to represent them in the setting, both in concept and in miniature form, just because I know I won't be able to express all of these ideas in miniature form myself, but I might inspire someone else to do so. Last but not least, I will be purposely breaking the fourth wall in this video and making visual and behavioral comparisons between 40k app humans and portrayals of mutants or monsters in pop culture outside of 40k. Just so as to provide an idea of how they would be experienced or encountered in the setting. Let's get into it. We're going to start our exploration into the subject of app humans by going over one of the most well-known kinds of app humans in the setting, the Ogren. Ogren, or Homo sapiens gigantis, are app humans which evolved into existence on worlds that had very little use to the empire of humanity that existed before the Imperium of Man. Most of these worlds were often barren and possessed high gravity and were often used as prison worlds for the unfavorable in society at the time. When the Dark Age of Technology ended and the Age of Strife occurred, these prison worlds suffered the same fate as most human inhabited worlds. They were isolated and their populations had to struggle to survive in the environments that they found themselves on. The populations on these barren prison worlds eventually freed themselves of their cells, likely organizing themselves into groups, which first likely started out as prison gangs and then tribes over time. Composed of some of the most unruly of civilization, the physically weak and those who were not brutal enough to survive were likely eliminated first. Being that food was scarce on the barren worlds, cannibalism might have been one of the ways that the weaker of the population were disposed of eventually. Strength was a physical limitation to survival, as these worlds usually had a higher and thus heavier gravity effect than a standard Terran-like world. Those of wider compact and muscular structure fared better in these environments than those of other builds, able to withstand the weight of the world's gravitational pull. Technology in these worlds either did not exist or did exist but could not exist over long periods of time because the number of those who knew how to maintain and operate them dwindled. Without technology to aid in their survival, they as humans began to regress to a primitive might makes right style of society and environment, where strength and toughness were valued over intellect and intelligence. It has been said that the Ogren mental processes did not necessarily decrease in effectiveness, but that it only became solely focused on the matters of survival. If you take these elements, add the ability to reproduce, and give the population of these worlds 5,000 years or so of survival and endurance, long bouts of starvation and violence, the result will be Ogren. Ogren are tall, muscular, thick-skinned, and physically imposing app humans who originated in such worlds as the ones I've described, and are said to be the largest and most powerful of the registered app human types in the Imperium of Man. Almost twice as tall as a regular human being, and even taller than an Astartes, Argon are either very muscular or lean on the side of being morbidly obese depending on the conditions of the world they were shaped on. 
Argon are seen to be simple-minded and relatively unintelligent due to the fact that thinking was not a required aspect of their survival on the worlds they developed on. Most Argon have difficulty speaking proper Low Gothic, counting up to double-digit numbers, or understanding complicated words. But what they lack in the common perception of intelligence, they make up for in raw, brutal strength. This combined with their simple-mindedness actually makes them near-perfect warriors for the Astra Militarum. Once Argon are indoctrinated with the Imperial cults, they become loyal and stubborn fighters who believe the Emperor watches their every action in battle and who strive to serve the Emperor until they die. Temperamentally, they are usually calm and sociable, especially if they are a part of an Astra Militarum detachment. This docile state completely disappears in battle, as Argren revel in fighting, conflict, and opportunities to display their toughness. Their thick skin protects them from many forms of harm, and their natural aggression makes them a terror to behold on the battlefield. The majority of Ogren exist as feral tribes on Forgotten Worlds who are constantly fighting each other. They are frequently compared to orcs in this regard by some Imperial authorities. Sometimes, the Astra Militarum is known to capture entire tribes from these worlds, transport them to worlds of conflict, and release them as unwillingly conscripted troops thrown into a conflict light years away from their home worlds. Ogren have mutated to such an extent that their condition is genetically inherited, which makes them a legitimate abhuman strain, meaning Ogren give birth to Ogren. However, their condition does not limit them to the environments that they developed in, meaning Ogren can survive on worlds without high gravity, but can, and often do, thrive in high gravity environments due to their physical structure. There are actually a variety of types of the Ogren abhuman mutation, designated Homo sapiens gigantis alpha, Homo sapiens gigantis theta, type 4, type 7a, Homo sapiens gigantis gigantis, Homo sapiens gigantis chronopus, and the gray Ogren. However, some believe that each of these are different strains of the Ogren abhuman. I am unable to tell the difference between these types, however, Homo sapiens gigantis gigantis is almost definitely a designation for Ogren giants. Ogren have been in service to the Imperium of Man since their discovery and are the most common form of abhuman auxilia, fulfilling a variety of direct, brutal roles such as the Ogren Charonite of the 30th millennium, the Bulgrim and the Gunluggers of the 40th millennium. They have even fought against the Imperium, tricked by traitor forces or otherwise corrupted by chaos, which have produced Ogren Berserkers of Renegade Militia, Chaos Ogren, about Chaos ships, even Chaos Ogren corrupted directly by the Chaos Gods into Chaos Abominations. Another thing about Ogren is that they as a abhuman species can often experience the same mutations that baseline humans can, which can and often does lead to Ogren versions of other abhumans and mutants such as Ogren Psychers, Ogren Perpetuals, etc. Ogren are claustrophobic and uncomfortable in tight spaces, and perhaps this is a distant impulse left from their baseline human ancestors who spent their lives in prison cells. In regards to how I visualize the Ogren, being that they are so common, I don't really have to visualize due to them being featured in art and video games of Warhammer 40k. But if I were to make a pop culture reference or visual comparison, I would do so to the idea of Mr. Hyde as in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, specifically with how he was portrayed in the movie League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, as well as his portrayal in the movie Van Helsing. Games Workshop makes miniatures for this app human strain, as well as a variety of different companies. The links to some I will put in the descriptions below. Ogren are treated as a kind of comic relief in the 40k setting, and that is likely propaganda to protect us from the horror that they represent. Given a few generations on a barren, high-gravity world, most human populations will develop into Ogren. Ogren are treated almost as children because they struggle with meeting the Imperium's standard of intelligence, but each and every Ogren is a product of generations of brute strength and survival in some of the harshest conditions in the galaxy. Most Ogrens can call the worst of society during the Dark Age of Technology their ancestors, and their existence amongst their own kind is a testament to their toughness. 
Make no mistake about it, Argon may struggle with counting up to 5 in Low Gothic, but they do not struggle in killing things. If the Imperium fell, along with its reliance on technology, the majority of humanity would die. As we cry out for the salvation and reach out for the protection of what we thought were our closest and most dim-witted allies, the Ogren will survive and endure, having learned enough about us to know how long they'd have to wait before they could eat us. On the hive world of Necromunda, there are several houses that vie for power and control over the limited resources of the planet. There exists organizations which are referred to as houses, but are actually little more than hive gangs. Within these groups of organizations, there exists a organization called the House of Chains, more commonly known as House Goliath. House Goliath is an artificial house made from the combined efforts of two other Necromunda houses, House Etcher and House Van Sar. The purpose of creating the Goliaths was to create a slave class of workers that would work in the most inhospitable areas of the hive world. Rapidly grown in Amneo vats, they would be physically strong, tough, and robust in stature, beings who revere strength over everything else and like to show off their muscles. They were at a time genetically unstable and lived very short lives due to the stems that they would have to take to maintain their physical stature. However, the House of Chains has begun to change, slowly but surely. Within the House Goliath, there are certain hierarchies, right? Vatborn, meaning those Goliaths who were created to be such, Unborn, who are regular people who wish to join House Goliath and bulk themselves up using stems and the 40k version of steroids, and then there are Natborn. Nat-born Goliaths are born as Goliaths and do not need to take stems to maintain their figure. They enjoy longer lives and have a higher intelligence than their Vat-born counterparts. The Nat-born Goliaths are the reason why the Goliaths are included in this video. If Goliaths no longer need to be made via chemical processes, if they can sexually reproduce and birth Goliaths, then this means that Alpha Goliaths are essentially ab-humans. The matter of whether or not this is true is up for debate, but I thought they were worthy mention in this video. Goliaths and Slave Ogren often work together in the depths of the hive world of Necromunda, and while they can be mistaken for each other, there are some key differences. Goliaths are far more muscular than the standard Ogren, and that's not even to say that they are stronger, only to say that they are visually more muscular. Goliaths are also more intelligent than Ogren, especially the Alpha Goliaths, and they possess an almost animal cunning that is, while slow moving, both brutal and relentless. Goliaths can speak Gothic, both high and low, count and use weapons. Similar to Ogren, they revel in fighting and showing their toughness. If Natborn Goliaths were to leave Necromunda and establish themselves as a more defined part of the Imperium of Man, they could very well be considered their own kind of abhumans. They are already built for service and hard physical labor in environments that regular humans cannot work, and their physiology does not limit them to one environment, so they could potentially thrive. They could also potentially be more loyal than Ogren so long as they are given the ability to earn their way through work. House Goliath itself came into existence because the Goliaths on Necromunda overcame their taskmasters in an uprising in the Hive world. But instead of trying to take over everything, they just kept working, only this time it was for themselves. The Goliaths have the potential to be a larger abhuman strain potential that others in the setting have already realized. The Imperial Fist Chapter, successors of the Imperial Fist Legion, renowned for their stubborn durability and practices emphasizing the endurance of physical pain and the displays of toughness, often recruit candidates to the chapter from the gangs of Necromunda, the Goliaths being amongst them. Without a doubt, Natborn Goliath youth are recruited into the chapter because of their warlike spirit and physical strength. GW makes miniatures for Goliaths as part of their Necromunda line of miniatures. Neandors or Homo sapiens hyanothus are an abhuman species restricted to the world of Hyanoth 4. They are a regressed strain of abhumans that were actually brought into existence by their highborn masters who only use the humans that Neandors once were for physical labor. 
After thousands of years and many generations of this, the Neanderthals regressed to a primitive-like state of physical and psycho-emotional being. They are described as lowbrow savages, and they are a strain of abhuman that is said to be limited to Hyanoth 4. In available artwork of them, they appear to be hairy, their skulls protrude in the front, and they have a heavy brow ridge. Neanders are literally humans who have regressed into Neanderthals again in the 40k setting. In fact, the artwork for them is a reworking of existing artwork of a Neanderthal profile. If they are based off of Neanderthals, then we can make some more assumptions about them, primarily that they are likely shorter than the average man, hunched in posture, and are very similar to our ideas of cavemen. Pictorial representations of Neanderthals can all include representations of Neanderthals in pop culture. GW actually doesn't make miniatures of this app human strain, likely because they are not used in war. Pelagors, also known as Homo sapiens oceanus, are a strain of ab human that refers to those ab humans which could have either been modified during the dark age of technology to survive on or have naturally evolved on worlds completely covered in water. Most Pelagors have developed webbed hands and feet to be able to move more efficiently in water. They have developed gills to be able to breathe underwater and extract oxygen from their aquatic environment, but most still have functional lungs as well, which they are able to switch between use of. However, just like with all species, there are variations and degrees of mutation. The amphibious Pelagors that I was describing are the most human amongst them. According to available information, the other extreme are the Pelagers that live deep in the oceans of these water worlds and seem to stay there, able to withstand the pressures of those depths, thus possibly losing their functional lungs and depending fully on their gills. These Pelagers are said to possess iron hard muscles, fish like scales, and are the same size and height as Ogren which is terrifying. As far as visual representation is concerned, the sky is the limit with representing Pelagors, but I would say Pelagors are more human looking than they are fish like, so they do have a vaguely human form, they just have varying degrees of webbed and aquatic features, you know? GW does not make miniatures of this abhuman strain, but feral pelagors can be represented by miniatures of the Age of Sigmar range, and I'm sure there are many miniature companies that make miniatures which could proxy as Homo sapiens oceanus. I would also suggest for those interested in the Pelagors to read up on the lore and the mythologies of the Necromunda house, the House de Lac. Um, because it is strange to say in the least, in a way that has a Pelagor-like influence. Nightsiders, or Homo sapiens tenebris, are a strain of abhumans who have developed on worlds that are almost completely shrouded in darkness. These worlds are either so distant from their star, or any star, that only a percentage of light reaches them, or otherwise their planets don't rotate, which could lead to light only existing on one side. Worlds such as these wouldn't normally be survivable, but were likely made so during the Dark Age of Technology. Once the Age of Strife began, the populations on these worlds could barely depend on the technology they had in order to survive, and this influenced their physical mutation and adaptation to the conditions of their worlds over many generations. The physical expression of these abhumans vary. Some have very large bulbous eyes, while others have vegetal eyes and depend on their other senses in order to move around efficiently. According to available information, nightsiders are known for using means such as echolocation, which means they generate a sound and listen to the sound bounce off the environments around them in order to understand the dimensions of their surroundings, similar to how bats do. Many have tapital reflexes, which is basically when the eye develops a yellowish golden layer which has more sensitive light receptors and can help most nocturnal creatures see in the dark. It often appears as eyes that glow in the dark. They sometimes have chemiluminescence, which enables them to glow in the dark to some degree. They often have heightened senses of smell and hearing as well. In appearance, Homo sapiens tenebris are said to either have large eyes or no eyes at all, pale or translucent skin, body parts that glow, 
and their appearance reviles those who they seek to serve. They are sometimes deployed in subterranean or night world operations as part of the abhuman auxilia force of the Imperial Guard. For some reason, I do not visualize these abhumans standing on their two legs, but crouching on all fours. I imagine their physical movements to be erratic and twitch-like, as they are sensitive to sound around them and react to what they hear. The cave creatures from the movie The Descent, just without the fangs, basically. Or maybe with them depending on how they formed. GW does not make miniatures of this strain of abhuman, but miniatures from the Age of Sigmar range could possibly be used, as well as Urgul miniatures from the Blackstone Fortress miniature box set. For more civilized nightsiders, you could take the Astra Militara miniatures, take plastic glue to the face of the miniatures, getting rid of their eye sculpts. Beastmen, or Homo sapiens variatus, are the most bestial of abhumans as their physical bodies are often the conglomerate of both human and animal features. It's actually hard to determine just how beastmen came into existence. There are some theories that modifications were made to humans during the age of technology that lived in certain environments, and these modifications became genetic mutations, and these mutations were passed down, thus establishing a new abhuman species. There are those who believe that beastmen are the result of chaos corruption of the human form. What is known is that the existence of beastmen is threatened. So long as they keep their abhuman status, they are relatively safe as part of the Imperium of Man. But questions are arising as to whether or not they are actually abhumans, or if they are mutants. Though it is clear that beastmen give birth to beastmen, which makes them an abhuman strain, it is not clear just how they came into existence. If they came to be due to a mutation, then what kind of circumstances would produce the mutation that would create beastmen? Their forms are so contradictory to the standard humanity that suspicions arise. If they were created during the Dark Age of Technology, then who would create such a monstrosity and for what reason? Another possibility is that they were affected by the corrupting powers of chaos. Many in the 40k universe are convinced of the latter theory, and for this reason, even if the beastmen are loyal to the Imperium and the Emperor of Mankind, they are often mistreated and treated poorly and disregarded. Ironically, this actually pushes beastmen toward the service of Chaos and the Dark Powers, because at least to those forces which serve the Chaos Gods, they themselves are normal and treated with some semblance of normalcy and respect. When we say beastmen, the image that usually comes to mind is of a horned and hooved, fawn-like or sitter-like, half-human, half-goat beastmen, which is the common type of beastmen in Warhammer 40k. However, as with all abhumans, there are variations. Technically, any half-human, half-animal abhuman can literally be considered a beastman or part of the Homo sapiens variatus specification. GW has made some Beastmen miniature sculpts for Blackstone Fortress. We can represent Feral Beastmen by using the Age of Sigmar range, and there are a variety of companies that make super cool Beastmen sculpts. And so the, the options are endless. And as far as pop culture, um, there are so many representations of uh, Beastmen or the archetype of Beastmen in pop culture that you know you can really just choose one. Felinids are a strain of ab humans that are found across the galaxy in the 40k universe but were possibly first encountered on the world of Carlos McConnell, a world likely named after the rogue trader who discovered it. The pseudoscientific name for felinids is Homo sapiens hirsutus. According to information gathered by crew mercenaries, felinids can be found across the galaxy. Besides their extremely long claws, which are said to be the length of their forearms, they are hardly distinguishable from regular humans. They do serve in the Astra Militarum and are known for largely being indifferent or unaffected by the most brutal of conflicts with their enemies. Felinids in the 40k universe are often the subject of memes and cringeworthy cat-styled artwork, but these portrayals are largely uncommon, though not impossible, in the Imperium of Man. In fact, if they were to look more like cats than average humans, they would be considered a kind of beastman. I like that in the lore, felinids look like regular humans except for a few details, because I like subtle things. But the ways that you can portray a felinid are, you know, the, the sky's the limit. 
Ratlings are said to be the smallest of the ab human strain. Their growth is stunted by years of inbreeding on their often feudal or agricultural homeworlds. Ratlings, or Homo sapiens minimus, are almost useless to the Imperium besides fulfilling illegal trade amongst the ranks of the Imperial Guard and occasionally serving as accurate snipers in conflicts. They are not strong, nor are they honorable by most standards. On their homeworlds, they live hedonistic and incestuous lifestyles, eating and drinking and clapping cheeks constantly, reproducing at rapid rates and solidifying the stunting effects of physical incest on their abhuman strain. GW actually does make miniatures of this abhuman species and abhuman strain, uh, but I'm sure other companies also make proxy models and models that could be proxied as representing these abhumans, these ratlings. Last but not least, we have Longshanks, or Homo sapiens elongatus. Longshanks are an abhuman species often found on worlds with low levels of gravity, which over time has affected their height. In appearance, they are often bald-headed with extremely pronounced eyes and long legs. They have very little use to the Imperium of Man as a whole because worlds with normal or high levels of gravity cause them to suffer physically. There are quite a few worlds that have longshanks, but like I said, they're not very useful to the Imperium beyond the worlds on which they developed. Abhumans are one of my favorite aspects of Warhammer 40k because I like the idea that humanity is still being physically changed by the environments they lived in. I also like the irony that the Imperium treasures the human form as being near divine in design, but does not see the designs of abhumans as divine despite the fact that they are illustrations of how adaptable our species is and how survivable we all are in a variety of environments. My love of abhumans is actually why I created my own in the setting. My homebrew chapter, The Void Lions, is composed of an abhuman peoples called the Leonicenes, or the people of the white lion, which are a proto augrin strain of Felinid found on their homeworld of Zulu 9 before it was devoured by the Tyranids. They are basically lion men, and are an abhuman strain protected by the Inquisition for their usefulness against the Tyranids. If you'd like to hear more about them, check out my video on the Void Lions chapter. Which of the abhuman strains is your favorite? The 40k universe is vast and there can be as many different kinds of abhumans as there are environments that they could survive in. If you could create an abhuman species, what would they be? What would they look like and how would they fit into the Imperium of Man? Let me know in the comments below. Kind of like an extra element to this video and in connection to its theme, I'm going to put a link in the description below. This link is going to be to another YouTube channel. This YouTube channel is a border prince. Here at Inquisitor Vaughn, we stand a border prince because he does audio narratives of some of the older stories of Warhammer 40k. The link that I'm going to put in the comments below is a story about ab humans in the setting. Uh, it's called Children of the Emperor by Barrington J. Bailey and uh, Border Prince does an amazing job with narrating it. I highly recommend listening to this audio story. It is amazing, it is one of my favorite, and it really begs the question just how certain ab humans came to be in the Warhammer 40k universe. Without anything else to be said, Inquisitor Vaughn out. Remember, the Emperor protects and the future is successor.